This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Picking and choosing verses out of context is how centuries of Christianity have created a persona of the Messiah that is far from reality. In this inaugural episode of Charting the End, Michael Rood sheds light on how we got here and how we can unravel history to get back to the truth. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom Torah fans, welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. And we're not just saying that, Michael Rood is teaching tonight. How did we swing that? Well, guess what? We found a series that he recorded in 2020 that has never been broadcast. No one has ever seen this, and you are going to be the first to see it tonight. In fact, Michael recorded so much material that we're still not, still not sure how many episodes this is going to be. We're look, thinking maybe like 10, uh, but tonight you will see the episode one, the very first one. So uh, what a perfect day to start something new and exciting for Michael Rood. But first, it is the first Shabbat of the new year. It is the first Shabbat of the month of the Aviv on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. There you see it right there. Now, please welcome my co-host, Michael Ro Michael Root. No, you're Ted Clayton. Well, I don't think I'm Michael Root, but then again, I could be. No, I'm kidding. Well, welcome, Ted. Well, thank you, Scott. I got Michael Root on the brain because I it's know, so exciting. because it's so exciting. This is crazy. Ladies and gentlemen, call your friends, call your neighbors, call your distant relatives, <laughs> get people to YouTube right now and watch Michael Root teaching this is just such a great thing. And ladies and gentlemen, he is in great form on this video. Everyone knows uh, Michael has had a stroke. Uh, this is before he had his stroke. We found that there was this just tremendous set of teachings that were put in the archive, and we had almost basically forgotten that they were even there. Yeah. And uh, one of our producers went through and said, do you know we've got Michael teaching all of this? And we said, oh my gosh, we've got to get this out to the people. So tonight is the first episode yep. of this great series directly from Michael Rood. And it's exactly how it is titled, Charting the End, literally going yes. through the, uh, the revelation yes. with his revelation chart. Yes. Where are we? What th what happens next? Where you know in all this type of stuff? Where are we in this timeline? Yes. Uh, and it's a great series. And we thought it was going to be maybe three or four episodes. Just the other day, I was talking to our production manager Yev, and she says, yeah. "Actually, there's ten. Oh my gosh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, you've yeah. got to see these shows. These are going to be tremendous." Pure Michael Rood as you know him, and it is just gonna be great. I can't wait to even start. Oh, yeah. But before we start, we have to tell everybody that we are two weeks out from Passover. Ladies and gentlemen, we have such a lineup. Scott, tell oh. us about the lineup for Passover. So we got, the first person up is Matthew Vanderels. Yes. Uh, and then we have Avi Lipkin. Yes. And Jake Hilton. Now, Tell yes. us about what Jake Hilton is going. We, last week we talked about Avi. Yes. We talked about uh, Matthew Van mm -hmm. Hoogles. Tell us this week about what you think that Jake might be talking about. You know, when I talked to Jake uh, earlier this week, he told me he doesn't even have a title yet, but it's something very special that he's planning. Uh, it, it, it coincides, of course, with Passover and the Exodus and all that type of thing. Right. But he was uh, being kind of tight-lipped about it. And uh, he's well, actually going to be doing our uh, our Passover Seder as well. With that's Michael. right. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have not signed up for Passover, you need to sign up to watch online. Unfortunately, we're already full here, or fortunately, I guess is a good way of <laughs> yeah. saying it. The, the, the room is sold out here at a Root Awakening headquarters for Passover, but you can watch from the comfort of your own home if you go to... PassoverCharlotte.com. PassoverCharlotte.com. Mm -hmm. Fill out the information. You can watch... Passover 2024, Return to the Mountain, 
from the comfort of your very own home. And ladies and gentlemen, yes, Michael Rood will be there, and Jake will be leading us through the Seder uh, that evening, but just great, great teachings. You don't want to miss a single moment of this time, starting Friday night uh, with our Shabbat Night Live. Mm -hmm. We'll have all of our guests there uh, talking about what they're going to be talking about, and we have a special teaching from Michael Rood that yes. night of a previous Passover. Yes, a Passover at a hotel. So at a you, hotel, it, yes, exactly. It's the one where we did the split rock and the waterfall. Oh, all that one. that's going to be that's great. a great one, ladies and gentlemen. You're not going to want to miss that. And then Saturday, all day long, we're going to have teaching, and then of course. Saturday night, the Seder, the mm-hmm. famous Michael Rood Seder. Yes, Michael will be there, and we will just just have this great, great time yeah. for Passover 2024. And I think it's going to be uh, you know more in depth because each of the teachers has two hours. Yes. Like, can you imagine? Okay, first, like the Avi Lipkin thing, for example. Avi's not teaching, but he's going to have two hours where we can ask questions of him. And That's talk about the plan. The, yes. the beautiful thing there is, very few people that know more about the history of Israel and the land of Israel than Avi Lipkin because he's been there literally uh, giving tours uh, of of, uh, the whole uh, Mm -hmm. Israel, the the holy land is where I'm having problems speaking now. (laughs) And he's just a great, great uh, knowledge, just uh, just a, uh, a huge knowledge base. Uh, for us to go from. So that's going to be a very exciting yep. thing. That's Passover in two weeks' time. Yeah, two weeks. That's incredible. That's, that's I know going it, by right? crazy. You know what's going by like crazy also is this, uh, the love gift for this month. We're, yes. uh, you know, we're already on the, uh, the 12th of April here, and we, and we need to, uh, you know, tell people that you're going to miss out on this if you skip that's for right. much longer. So this is the best translation. This is from uh, Miles Jones and Patrick McGuire, who just finished up their series last week. And it's all about going through manuscripts that are in Hebrew to get the best translation ever, the most accurate of the revelation. That's right. So that is an incredible thing, and they talk all about how they did it in this, and actually how people can actually, I don't think we've talked about this before, uh, people can actually get involved in helping them translate and oh, they wow. also need like uh, you know volunteer staff members for all kinds of different things too. Even if you know Hebrew is not your thing, uh, you can help out you know with support staff and all this kind of thing because they literally have hundreds of people all over the world helping with this. Now this is for the fifty dollar level. Tell me about the yes. hundred dollar level of giving this month. So here is the hundred dollar level. You get the teaching and a vial of Rose of Sharon uh, anointing oil yeah. and a beautiful. This is crystal crystal uh, bottle. This, feel how heavy this thing is. Um, oh my goodness! Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's so beautiful. Beautiful. And you get that for a gift of $100 or more because Michael says, you know what, I want to give something nice to, to people who give to this ministry. But this is this is the unique but, thing. Yeah, this is the neat thing. Yeah. yeah. This is an Omer counter. So yeah. this is uh, it's a handmade thing, obviously, to help us count the Omer because sometimes, you know, a week into the Omer, we kind of start losing track and and we've got to, uh, just, so where are we? So th- this keeps helps us keep track between uh, Shav- or between the uh, Day of First Fruits and Shavuot. Shavuot. Yeah. Okay, well, great, Scott. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right, here is what you're going to see tonight. Every one of the Gospels can be synchronized. And fortunately, they can be synchronized on the one event that is recorded by all four Gospel authors. The one miracle recorded by all four gospel authors that transpire right in the middle of Yeshua's ministry, which is the feeding of the 5,000, which Matthew, Mark, and Luke tells us happens right at the end of the summer. And the Gospel of John, the very next chapter, he's going up to the Feast of Tabernacles, as he is in Matthew, Mark, and and, uh, Luke as well. So we have that synchronizing moment in time that allows us to understand the chronology of the gospel so that the music can all play, so that every incident makes sense. Aha, see, I told you that you would love this. The inaugural episode of Charting the End is next, where Michael Rood sheds light on how we can unravel history to get back to the truth. And before Michael, we're gonna go to Michael with the Kiddush. Next. Not one book of the Bible was written by Greeks. They were all written by Hebrews. So why do we accept that the best and most accurate translations of the New Testament come from the Greek? Don't 
think this is something that's going to tear apart your faith. The story is essentially the same, but there is tweaking that's done in there that has very harmful effect. So we need to seek relationship with the God of truth right. and get back to what was originally said. In the best translation, Dr. Miles Jones and Patrick McGuire reveal a fascinating new methodology to create the most accurate translation of the book of the Revelation ever produced. This month's Love Gift teaching, the best translation, is not available anywhere online, but we'll give it to you as our thanks for supporting A Rude Awakening International. When you donate $50 as a love gift to this ministry in April, you'll get The Best Translation with Dr. Miles Jones and Patrick McGuire on DVD or Blu-ray. Donate $100 and we'll send you The Best Translation, plus a Rose of Sharon gift set featuring a vial of anointing oil and a beautiful crystal bottle. Donate $300 and we'll send you The Best Translation, The Rose of Sharon crystal bottle set, and a handmade wooden Omer counter to celebrate the countdown to Shavuot. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Thank you. Your donations ensure that important teachings like the best translation keep coming from A Rood Awakening International. Use your smartphone to scan the QR code on your screen to donate now and receive these limited time gifts or call 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online with a donation at monthlylovegift.com. There is a rabbinic tradition, even a takanot, a law which changed biblical law, that before one eats bread, one must wash their hand with a two-handled pot, a nagel vessel, and say this prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments, commanding us to wash the hands. Nowhere in the scripture is this ever commanded. In fact, the rabbis will plainly say that we are the ones that made it up, and when you are obeying us, you're obeying God. Well, Yeshua said, do not follow the takanot of the Pharisees. Do not follow their man-made rules and regulations. But every time there is bread, every time we can remember what Yeshua said, what he put in place. And we can say the prayer, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam, Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And Yeshua said, I am the bread brought forth in the earth. This represents my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, if it's every meal, if it's every Sabbath, you do it in remembrance of me, because by his stripes we were healed. And Yeshua took the cup, and he said, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pari HaGafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood, the broken covenant in which we were offered to be priests and kings. Yeshua 
paid the price. He renewed the covenant with us and made us priests and kings. And so as often as we do this, we remember this and we reign as priests and kings now and will do so in the future with Yeshua for a thousand years in our resurrected body along with his resurrected body. And we do this in remembrance of him. Shalom. The book of the Revelation, chapter 10, verse eight. The voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take it, eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in your mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. It was in my mouth as sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Again, he said to me, thou must prophesy before many people and nation and tongues and kings. Four verses in the middle of the book of the Revelation. But how can we tell the story if this is how we've learned the Bible? By isolating numbered sound bites here, just a couple verses, four sentences, out of the middle of the book of Revelation, because those four verses don't tell us the story. To understand the book of the Revelation, we have to understand the entire context of the book of the Revelation. And in this presentation on the Revelation scroll, I am going to attempt to tie together the things that are necessary to know so that we can get a proper interpretation of the book of the Revelation. The Apostle Paul said that the Torah is our schoolmaster to lead us to the Messiah. The commandments of God, the instructions from God gives us the foundation from which we are going to understand the entire scripture. And these are the scriptures. The entire volume of the Hebrew scriptures in the English language, there's not that much to it. But in order to understand the book of the Revelation, we have to have a command of these things. We have to be able to go back and understand all of the references that are in the book of the Revelation, hundreds of them, but the first thing we have to know that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, as it says in the King James, or as we understand and can read directly from the Hebrew book of Revelation, which is in the British Royal Library. This is the revelation, the good news of the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. And so I am going to give you a background and to understand the book of the Revelation because if we are going to tell the story, if we're gonna prophesy before many nations and peoples and tongues, we have to understand what the story is. The book of Revelation is not a group of numbered sound bites and this is how most of us learn the Bible. Most of us grow up in church and four verses or four lines are read and then the, the minister says, may the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his holy word. He closes the book and then takes it completely out of context and says, well, what does this mean to us today? Well, frankly, it doesn't mean anything to us today if we don't understand the context to whom it was originally written and this is the revelation of the Almighty. This is his revelation to mankind. And the book of the Revelation is the only book in the Bible that was personally written by the Messiah, by Yeshua himself. Yohanan, John, is his scribe. Just as Baruch was the scribe of Jeremiah, Jeremiah didn't write a single word himself, but Baruch, his scribe, did. Yeshua reveals this to Yohanan, who is his scribe. This is 
about 60 years after the resurrection, Yeshua has been seated at the right hand of the throne of the Almighty, and he is then given this revelation to show to his servants the things which must come to pass. I am telling you right now, just from these four sentences, that the scroll of the revelation is going to be sweet to the taste as well. But there are things that are going to be terrifying to go through. They are going to make us sick to our stomach to go through. This is why the book of the Revelation is not written to the innocent bystander. It's not written to the pew warmer or the casual Christian. It is written to the servants of the Messiah. The servants, the doulos, the sold out bond slaves who are actually doing the work of the ministry, who have been called, who have been sanctified, who are living as priests and kings now, who are declaring his word, who are, who are reigning with prayer in authority now. That's to whom it was written. This is not written for those who, oh, I, I wanna jump right ahead. I wanna understand the mark of the beast, or I wanna understand the 144,000. You know, that is so deep into this. This is so far, far beyond the pay grade of your, your casual Christian, or someone who's just read the Bible just a few times through. This is written to those who are living to serve, who have paid the price, who have picked up their execution stake and are following Yeshua, who are enduring trouble and tribulation now because of their stand, because they are doing what the word of God tells us that we are to do. So I'm going to just back up a little bit right here to give you a context for these four sentences that I just read from the 10th chapter of the Revelation because this is going to help us to understand that context is everything. Revelation chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow upon his head. His face shone like the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. He had in his hand a little scroll opened and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice like a lion roaring. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when I was about to write, I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up those things and write them not. Yohanan was told by Yeshua to write the things which come hereafter. He was about to write it and Yeshua said, stop, do not write the things which are written in the scroll. I don't want my servants to know these things. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, he lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him that lives forever and ever who created heaven and all the things that are therein and the earth and all things that are in there and the sea and all things that are therein, that there shall be no more delay. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when the seventh angel shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be executed. This is the seventh and the last trump. When that trumpet sounds, the mystery of God is executed. The mystery of God, which we read about all through the epistles, that we read about in Yeshua's own words as he spoke to Matthew. When the seventh and last trumpet sounds, the mystery of God is executed. Then I heard a voice that spoke to me and said, go take the little book, the little scroll out of the hand of the angel. And the angel said to eat it. It's going to taste sweet to your mouth, but it's going to make you sick to your stomach. What is this showing us? He cannot tell us. Yohanan is not allowed to write the words which roared like a lion. 
Yeshua doesn't want his servants to know about that. But he does want his servants to know that when the seventh trumpet sounds, the mystery will be executed. We are almost home. All of the trauma of the seven seals and the seven, uh, the six trumpets, all those things that have transpired before, we are right at the verge of the seventh trumpet sounding. And the mystery of God being executed, we are almost home at this point. This is the context of these words in this little scroll. But unless we have an understanding of the Torah, the prophets, the other writings, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, which complete that portion of the gospels, and then we understand the revelation that Yeshua gave personally to Peter and also to Paul, unless we understand these things, the book of the Revelation will not make sense. So I'm going to take you into the story. This is part of the greatest story that was never told and is not being told today because we are hearing Bible stories but we're not being told the story from the beginning to the end. Revelation 2221 is the close of the story that begins in Genesis 1-1. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to go into those scriptures. But in the course of doing that, we're going to be consulting with the chronological gospels. This took me more than 38 years of work to put every incident in the life and ministry of Yeshua in exact chronological order. And this I typify as a, a, a score to a symphony with all the lines, with all the instruments that are given their cues of when to play, what notes they're going to play. And that is how I look at the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each have a song that is being sung, notes that are being played, but they all have to be lined up together. They all have to be synchronized so that we understand when the, when the oboes come in with, with Matthew, when the woodwinds come in, when the timpanies come in, when the violins come in, and all the string instruments, they are, they are arranged on the score sheet, and it is only when we have the proper timing, because music exists in time, and the gospels exist in time. And when we can understand that all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, show the Messiah as he is fulfilling what he is required of the Torah to do. As it tells us in the book of Exodus, every male Israelite is required to go up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Lord three times a year. And when we then synchronize those feasts and understand that the Gospels tell us the story of Yeshua before he goes up to the feast, getting ready to go to the feast, he is at the feast, what he does after the feast, then getting ready to proceed and go up to the next feast. And so every one of the Gospels can be synchronized. And fortunately, they can be synchronized on the one event that is recorded by all four Gospel authors the one miracle recorded by all four gospel authors that transpire right in the middle of Yeshua's ministry, which is the feeding of the 5,000, which Matthew, Mark, and Luke tells us happens right at the end of the summer. And the Gospel of John, the very next chapter, he's going up to the Feast of Tabernacles, as he is in Matthew, Mark, and, and uh, Luke as well. So we have that synchronizing moment in time that allows us to understand the chronology of the gospel so that the music can all play, so that every incident makes sense. And sometimes we have uh, multiple authors recording the very same incident, but how the oboe plays that and how the violins play that is going to be a little bit different 
but it's all going to result in a symphony of the greatest story never told. When we get to the book of the Revelation, then we have the fifth gospel. This is the gospel, uh, the good news of the revealing of Yeshua as the Messiah. In the first four gospels, we see that no one was ever allowed to say to anyone that Yeshua was the Messiah. No one was allowed to say it. When people that had the demons cast out of them would, would cry out, with those demonic spirits in them, we know who you are, you're the son of David, you're the Messiah. Yeshua said, shut up, come out of them. He would not let it be spoken. To his apostles, his trained ones, he asked them, who do men say that I am? And they gave a litany of answers. Your John the Baptist rose from the dead. You're, 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 you're one of the prophets. And then Yeshua said to Peter, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Yeshua turned to Peter and all the apostles and disciples that were gathered there together. And he said to them, don't tell anyone. He told Peter specifically, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. I didn't reveal this to you. My Father in heaven revealed it to you. But don't tell anyone. I must go up to Jerusalem where I will be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles and the Gentiles will kill me. Yeshua himself only declared to one person one time that he was a Messiah, and that was to a Gentile Samaritan woman alone at a well when she said to him, I know that when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. And Yeshua said, you're speaking to him now. One time, to one person, he openly said, you are speaking to the Messiah. And so she went into the village, cried in the streets, the entire village came out. And then, after hearing what he said, one in the village said, we heard the woman, we didn't believe her. We heard your words. We know you are the Messiah. You are the savior of the world. Nowhere, no time in the entire range of the four, four gospels does Yeshua ever allow anyone to say that he is the Messiah because he didn't come the first time to reign and rule upon the earth as the Messiah. He did not come to fulfill those prophecies of the day of vengeance of our God, the multiple prophecies that are there in the scripture of when he, he takes his throne and reigns from the throne of David and he rules over the planet with a rod of iron in justice and righteousness goes throughout the entire world. He did not come the first time to establish his throne upon the earth. He would not let anyone even allude to that. He came the first time to fulfill the prophecy of Moses, that there is coming a, a prophet in the future, like unto you, Moses, the Almighty spoke to him, one who hears directly from me, knows me face to face. He'll never speak presumptuously. He will never speak his own words. He will only speak that which I tell him and the people are required to Shema. They must hear and obey that prophet or they will be judged. And that judgment will be eternal judgment if they do not hear the words of that prophet. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, that is when he was able to first utter those words that Yeshua forbid him from uttering before. He said, 
before those thousands of people gathered together on the Temple Mount on the day of Shavuot from all nations, all of these Israelites who are required to show up at this feast when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And he said, and this Yeshua, whom you crucified, God has raised him from the dead and has, has made him Lord and Messiah. It is the first time that anyone, and Peter was given the privilege of pronouncing Yeshua as the Messiah for the first time. We forget every time we read the Gospels, we go through, we see Jesus Christ and Christ and Jesus Christ. This is all, this is all nearly a generation after the event after the event in which Peter was allowed to speak that he was a Messiah. He, this does not even enter into the picture of Yeshua's ministry. No one called him Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. He's not the son of Mary and Joseph Christ. And so when we read the Gospels, if we hearken back to the time and the place, we just, we put in Yeshua, we understand he's Messiah, and there are reference to him being the Messiah. You know, born of Mary, Yeshua, who is also the Messiah. Well, that couldn't be declared at the time, but now we can declare it. And the book of the Revelation is the revealing of Yeshua, the Messiah not as just the prophet whom we are required to obey because right now in this, in this generation in where we are in time, this is where we are supposed to be. We are supposed to hear and obey him. As Yeshua declared, go into the whole world and make disciples and teach them what I taught you. This is not being done. We are told little Jesus stories, little Bible stories, but we're not teaching what Yeshua taught. We are not understanding that he did not come to destroy the Torah and the prophets. He came to fulfill these things. And all of the prophecies about the Messiah coming and reigning and ruling upon the earth, those things will be fulfilled. But so many times, I hear Christians who wanna blame the Jews for missing him coming the first time, but those prophecies are rather obscure. But the prophecies concerning the day of vengeance of our God, those prophecies that when Yeshua read the scroll of Isaiah to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the scroll because the next line he could not read to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God and for the next six chapters speaks of the Messiah coming with his garments bloodied who is coming to rule and reign upon the earth. That is the revealing of Yeshua Messiah and that is the book of the Revelation that we are going to get into. It is sometimes a bitter scroll. It is also a very sweet scroll because we realize that the price that we now pay for following him will be rewarded with, with responsibilities as priests and kings to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Israel, the Jews may have missed him for the most part coming the first time, but most of the Christian world has missed his second coming because they have replaced it with a hallmark channel Jesus and a hallmark heaven and people going to heaven sitting on clouds and, and strumming harps and growing wings, all these things that are complete fairy tales that were invented out of paganism to comfort people that are dead. But we don't comfort ourselves with lies, with fairy tales. We comfort ourselves with the very things that Paul was given revelation to comfort us. Because we do not sorrow as others sorrow. We do not sorrow as others who have no hope. Because we, if we believe 
that God raised Yeshua from the dead, we know that there is a resurrection. And just as Yeshua promised, there will be a resurrection. And in that resurrection, there will be a reward for the righteous. And there is going to be more than one resurrection. There is going to be a resurrection of the unjust. And there is going to be punishment. But we're not going to focus on that because our invitation is, as it is in the end of the book of the Revelation, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Come, join in the story. This is the greatest story that's, that's never told. This is the reality. This is Yeshua laying out the fulfillment of all of the prophecies in the Torah and the prophets and the writings, all of the things concerning him that will and must be fulfilled, Yeshua lays it out so his servants do not need to be deceived and his servants can have comfort in knowing that there is a resurrection and all that we do in this life, the price that we pay to serve him will be rewarded for a thousand years and then will be rewarded for all of eternity in a new heaven and new earth. The King James Version of the Bible will always be my favorite English version, but I know that there are a lot of man-made artifacts that uh, have been brought in, such as chapter and verse markings. There are no chapters and verses. This was originally a letter that was addressed to the seven assemblies in Asia Minor, and it starts out with a man-made appendage. The Revelation of St. John the Divine. If there's anything that is wrong in this book, it starts out with this inaccuracy. The very first line, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent it and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. 
Now, in the chronological gospels, I have corrected this, and that's why I call this the corrected King James Version of the Bible, because the King James Version has been corrected many times since 1611. As a matter of fact, uh, 1611, there were two corrections that were done that very year, and so we have to understand that language has changed. And basically, if we're reading the King James Version of the Bible today, we are not reading the 1611, we're reading the 1769 version. But yet, these man-made artifacts are still in there. It's important that we understand that the book of Revelation is the one book, the one scroll, the one letter that was written by Yeshua to his servants. And so, we are going to shed these conventions because we want to go right straight to what does the text say. And we're also, I'm going to, in the Revelation scroll, I'm going to be putting things in a little bit different order so that it reads more like a letter. Because we have from Yohanan, John, to the seven congregations in Asia, and then they're enumerated whereas the addressees don't come until several verses down the line, but I felt that in communicating the story, I would best be able to do it to the modern reader by going after the modern way of doing things, and that is to address it to whom it is written and put that right up front. Again, the book of the Revelation was originally written as a scroll, and it was sent to the seven assemblies in Asia Minor. So I wanna take you on that journey with me as we read these very things. Now, this is the, the beauty of, of what we have now. In the British Royal Museum, we have the beginning of the book of the Revelation in Hebrew. And I have a photocopy of this that was given to me by my friend Nehemia Gordon, who has been on the path of uh, finding ancient Hebrew manuscripts of the Gospels as well as other things, and he came across this revelation in the book of Revelation uh, in Hebrew. It says, as I have been saying for years, and I also call it in uh, my, my book, the five Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts is, is part of the fourth Gospel, it's really part of Luke, the extension of that, and then the Revelation is the fifth Gospel. I said, the book of the Revelation is good news to those who love his coming. It's bad news to the rest of the world. But I did not know at the time that I was speaking this, more than 20 years ago, that in the Hebrew, it literally says, the good news of the revealing of Yeshua Messiah. That's what it says. It literally says in Hebrew that it is the good news, the gospel, the good news of the revealing of Yeshua as the Messiah. And as I said earlier, Yeshua did not come the first time to be heralded as the Messiah and live happily ever after. This is purely ignorance of the scripture. He came not as the Messiah, but as the prophet. And as we read, especially the Gospel of John, but all the Gospels tell us that the people, when he does miracles, when he raises the dead, such as the young man, of the son of the widow at Nain, that when he raises that young man, the people were all declaring that the great prophet has risen among us. The great prophet. It is speaking of the prophet whom Moses prophesied. They are recognizing that he is the great prophet. And this was spread throughout the Galilee. Not just this miracle, but the testimony of the people that this is the great prophet. This is the one that we were expecting. And so just a few weeks later, when all of the Galilee and thousands and thousands of disciples got together, which was just days before the, the, the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Trumpets in the, in the Galilee, 
that when they assembled together and he fed the 5,000 with leavened barley loaves there, feeding the multitude, it says that they wanted to make him the king, wanted to make him king, and he had to separate himself from them because they recognized that he was the great prophet of whom Moses prophesied. Now, Yeshua still is that great prophet, the one that we must hear and obey. And that is why he said, go to his apostles, go out and make disciples of all nations and teach them what I taught you. Teach them to obey, hear and obey what I am telling you. Because there's going to be a judgment and Yeshua is the one who is going to be sitting on the throne. And that is why it's important that we understand and, and we, we, we grasp the gravity of that very revelation of him as the prophet who we must hear and obey. And as on the day of Pentecost or Shavuot, uh, Peter said, those who do not shema, do not hear and obey that prophet, will be destroyed. It is an eternal judgment and Yeshua as he said to the Pharisees and the religious leaders at the Feast of Pentecost, or Shavuot in John chapter five, he says, I am the one who is going to raise the dead. The Father has put all judgment into my hands and I am going to not only raise the dead, but I am going to be the one that judges you. And of course, they immediately, it says, began making plans how to kill him. Well, Yeshua still is that prophet and still very few people listen to him. But this is different. This is Yeshua who is going to be laying this out and he is, this is the revealing of Yeshua as the Messiah. And this is how it's going to take place. And so we start right from the very beginning. From Yohanan, John, to the seven assemblies, the seven congregations in Asia. Now, the, the word churches, um, Tyndall said we should strenuously avoid the word churches, and he only translated the word ecclesia as church twice in the Bible, in both times in reference to a pagan temple, because church and how it is developed is really a, a, wrong, a, a wrong concept. If we understand it as it is in the Hebrew, that it is a kahila, it is a, it is a congregation or congregations, kahilot, the seven congregations in Asia. And you know, so many times we think of churches as a building or what they've turned into. But the congregations uh, throughout the book of Acts were always meeting in the homes. It was a way of life. It wasn't something that people did once a week for you know, X amount of time. No, it was the, the same way that the synagogues were. The synagogues started all in people's homes. And then as they got larger, they built, uh, they, they built a, an edifice that would serve not only for the meeting of the congregation, but also for the school of the children and uh, community activities. But these are to the seven congregations in Asia, and then he names them. Ephesus, the first one. And fortunately, we have a great deal. We have two chapters in the book of Acts that deal with what happens at Ephesus so that we can have the context of what is, has transpired in the past and what is transpiring at the time this is written to the believers, to the congregations in Ephesus. We also have Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Thard Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so, from Yohanan to the seven congregations, grace to you and shalom from he who was, he who is, and is to come. Now, in Hebrew, as we see in the manuscript in the British Royal Museum, it is he who is, he who was, he who is to come, Hayah 
hove veyavo. Haya hove veyavo. Those three Hebrew words that are then contracted to Yehovah which is his memorial. This is how we remember his name forever. Because his name, Yehovah, means Haya Hove Veyavo, he who was, he who is, and he who is to come. And this is the salutation. Grace, grace, and shalom from he who was, he who is, and he who is to come and from Yeshua Messiah. Now, in the Hebrew, it says Yehoshua Messiah. Yehoshua is the formal, complete name of Yeshua. Yehoshua means Yehovah is our salvation. But that was shortened and shortened in the scripture, shortened during Israel's history from Yehoshua, the son of Nun, who was a servant of Moses, and then he is later in the prophets, then it's shortened down to Yeshua. It means the same thing, it's just a shorter form. And so commonly we call him Yeshua, but he is called Yehoshua in the text. Yehoshua, the Messiah, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead. Your King James Version says the first begotten from the dead, but that is the wrong usage of that word in the Greek, which is genao. No, he is the firstborn from among the dead, not the first begotten. And this is something that we go into in some detail and want you to understand because there is a difference between being begotten again, as it tells us in 1 Peter 2, 20, or, or 1, 3, and born again, as it says in 1 Peter 2, 23. So we're going to get into the detail on that because it's important to understand that Yeshua is not the first begotten from the dead, he's the first born from among the dead because he was resurrected with a new body, a new body that is equipped to live in the heavenly kingdom. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Shalom Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.